So you had this school of probably, I don't know, 5,000, and they're just slowly spiraling in this giant school. There was so many of them this day that from the boat on the surface, where normally you would see like little ripples in the water from the wind on the surface of the ocean, where they were was completely flat like glass. Welcome to Experiences You Should Have, your how-to guide for amazing experiences. I'm Gail, your host, and today we are going to be free diving down deep and learning about how to experience being with a multitude of mobula rays in Baja, Mexico. Now, Jay was recently on Experiences You Should Have on our diving Socorro episode. Episode, definitely go check it out if you are an avid scuba diver. But this episode today is about essentially a snorkeling and free diving experience with just this magnitude of mobula rays off of Baja. And J. Clue, he is with Dive Ninja Expeditions. He has over 6,000 scuba dives and he finds these unique experiences in the ocean and then he creates these small group experiences. And he's got a history in, in marine conservation and puts a focus on that on these trips and and shows you really the importance of protecting these animals. And he incorporates um, a program where you can go out and experience these mobular rays and also be a scientist for a day and work alongside marine biologists. It's a really neat program, and it's something I fully support. And we'll also be hearing from Jay in some future episodes Um as you can learn about how you can go on this whale watching expedition all around Baja. So stay tuned for some really fun ocean episodes. But let's get on to the Mobula Rays. Okay. Welcome to Experiences You Should Have, your how-to guide for amazing experiences. And I am here with Jay Clue to talk about swimming with the Mobula Rays. Hi, Jay. Welcome back. Hey, how are you? I'm good. good. I'm good. Awesome. Good I, to be back. Yeah, you've uh, just... You were just on an adventure in between uh, the last time we spoke. Where'd you go? Uh, a bunch of places. We were in the Bahamas for a bit at Tiger Beach and then out scouting some dolphins over in uh, Bimini for some new expeditions we're working on building. Oh, that sounds great. For you listeners out there, Tiger Beach is a very special place to me. It's actually one of my favorite dive spots in in the world. Um, so an episode will have to be done on Tiger Beach. So stay stay tuned. But uh, t- today we are actually talking about swimming with the Mobula Rays in Baja. And, and Jay, I know you have done this a lot, um, which also others can too through Dive Ninjas. But I just, I really want to hear your story about about being with these creatures in the mobula race. Okay. Well, to start with, uh, to give you some information on it and everything like that, here in Baja California, where I live, um, we have these aggregations of mobula rays that come every year, twice a year. Um, in the late springtime, we get them, and then again in the winter. But the aggregations that we see are some of the largest aggregations of any ray species on the entire planet. Um, it's mind-blowing, mind-blowing. Um, they kind of come together to mate and feed every year. So creating these gigantic schools all around the coast of Baja. Um, for favorite experience, though, it's, it's, the whole thing is just mind-blowing. It's one of those things that I could do it every single day, and it just never gets old. It's just one of those incredible, incredible things. Um, usually we go out, you know, first thing in the morning, and a lot of the places with dive ninjas like where we're going are these kind of more obscure areas. So they're like small towns and little villages on the beach and everything like that. 
Um, so you wake up in the morning and like the sun's rising over the ocean and it's just gorgeous, like beautiful, beautiful Baja sunrises. Um, and as you get out on the boat, you start to hear what sounds like popcorn. Um, is this kind of like slapping sound, like pop, 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 pop. And you'll see these guys just jumping from the water. Um, they're really acrobatic animals. They like to jump like pretty high. And some of them, they do flips. They do, you know, like jumps back in or anything like that. Wow. They can jump almost three meters out of the water. Um, mm. But they're, they're, they're like kind of silly about it. They're, they're not, they're very good at getting out of the water. They're not so elegant about getting back in the water. <laughs> So that's the uh, what the sound we hear is them usually splashing back in. You'll see them kind of flip end over end and land on their backs and all this kind of silly stuff. Really <laughs> crazy. Um, but you'll see these guys, and it's just you'll start seeing them jump, and we'll start to get closer with the boat and everything like that. And usually, what we say is when you see them jumping, for every one that you see jump, there's probably a few hundred more on the water wow. uh, when they get in these gigantic schools and everything. So we usually will follow them for a little bit on the surface. Um, and let them kind of get used to the boat being near the school and everything like that. Um, and then, you know, once we, the guides feel that it's okay and everything like that, we'll slip our gear on and we slip into the water. Is one of these things that I, I really even hard to put to words when you first see them. And whenever we have guests with us that do it for the first time, they're always like in complete shock and awe, like screaming through their snorkels and everything. Because you kind of hit the water and you start to look underwater and like, you know, you expect maybe to see like a small school or like 20 or 30 rays, but you look down and you see these schools that can be in the tens of thousands. Of wow. Oh my that goodness. Is, that sounds incredible. Uh, is unreal. And I mean, they're not that small. They're, they're about a meter or three feet wide, each one of them. Um, and they pack very close together. Um, and they kind of like to swim in these, like in like unison in a way. So it looks like they're almost like soaring through the water. And you get, you know, and I've had, we had a time this year, um, in this season, um, we were out and we were just getting, um, heading back around in towards the bay. And we came to an area where we started to see them jumping and wanted to check it out. So we get into the water and we find this gigantic school, like super, super huge school. Mm -hmm. They were about, uh, maybe from two, three meters around 10 feet, five to 10 feet under the surface of the water, the top of the school. And at points later in the day, I freed dove down to around 15 meters, around 45, 50 feet underwater, and I was still inside the school. So you're talking a school that was like 50 feet tall of these animals and just ginormously huge. And they're like, they swim around and in this one, this occasion, sometimes you'll get really lucky and they're very kind of calm and too busy doing their own thing and they don't really care about divers or anything. They're not scared of them or anything. And this day they were doing like a massive circle. So you had this school of probably, I don't know, 5,000 or I don't even know how many. Um, and they're just slowly spiraling in this giant school, creating almost like a big vortex. There was so many of them this day that from the boat on the surface, where normally you would see like little ripples in the water from the wind on the surface of the ocean, mm -hmm. where they were was completely flat like glass. The movement of all the animals under the water was actually creating a, like a flat uh, vortex, like a vortex that was flattening the surface of the water above. There was so many. Whoa. Oh my uh, goodness. And, what an experience. Uh, it's just crazy. And then, um, so we get in the water and we start swimming with them and everything like that. And usually you could spend a good amount of time with them, but they'll start to move. They start to travel. Um, so you have to kind of keep up with the school and everything. But this day, for whatever reason, and they start just, they were just sitting in a circle. Um, we continued staying with them for somewhere around three, four hours, something like that, in the water with them, with mm -hmm. barely even moving. Like they were just sitting in one place in a giant circle. So we like barely even had to swim. So you could, uh, once you get comfortable with that, like once they get comfortable with the divers and everything, you can free dive down into the pool and they usually won't even move away. Like they just kind of move around you and just take you as like you're another animal in the ocean. Um, so we're free diving down and like it's just is mind blowing, like unbelievably incredibly mind blowing. I went through two camera batteries. I had to get back on the boat, change my camera batteries in the house, pull my camera out of the housing, change the batteries, get back in the water, blow through in another entire battery. <laughs> And then get back on the boat. And I was like, all right, I think I'm uh, going to take a break now. We've been doing this for like four hours. 
And um, then the guests that were with us, a couple of the other guests, they decided they were going to uh, get out of the water too. And we made like a decision that like, okay, well, I think we've had enough. We've probably all taken like 10,000 photos and, uh, you know, we should head back to the marina before it starts getting dark. And that th they were still in this one spot. Mm -hmm. But to kind of like uh, put it to words, what you see when you're with them underwater, the only thing I can really compare it to would be like flying with a gigantic flock of birds because they move through the water when they like move their wings. It's just like this very graceful movement, um, kind of like a manta rays or anything like that. Um, but it reminds me very reminiscent of how birds fly, but they do move very slow. So there, it almost looks like it's in the whole thing's in slow motion. They're all moving together in one solid direction. Um, you've just got these, you know, thousands of these animals all around you, basically slowly just kind of cruising through the water and looking like it's, uh, you know, like a giant flock of underwater birds just like cruising and soaring through the ocean. What a beautiful picture. I, I want to be there. I want to be in the midst of this flock. It's, it's mind blowing. It is it, for me. Like I mean, I've lived in Baja California for about three years now, and it's still one of my favorite experiences. Not just in Baja, but in the entire world. Um, it, it's just it's mind blowing. Wow. And why should others have this experience? Why should others see and witness these schools of Mobula rays? I mean, I, I think it, it, there's so many reasons. One, it's one of the. It is. Uh, supposed to be the, the largest aggregation of any ray species on the entire planet. So this is something extremely unique that only happens in a certain period of the year um, when they actually come together like this. Because normally the rays, they don't stay like this. They're only coming together to mate. Um, so it's a very, very rare experience. Um, and it's just, it, it's incredible because it's so... Um, you know, like wild in a sense, like it's something you would see on like National Geographic or BBC, but it's something you can actually witness with your own eyes and, you know, take part in and just be part of that. They kind of make you feel like you become part of the school when you swim with them. Wow. Well, uh, let's let's get into some logistics here and and give our listeners a how-to guide to make it happen. So first off, when does this happen in the year? All right. So there's two uh, two times a year that we have aggregation. You have one that starts easily in around mid to late November and runs through December into sometimes early January. Mm -hmm. This is the smaller one. Um, during this season, you don't really get gigantic schools. You might see schools of a 50 or a hundred, maybe a couple hundred or something like that, but you won't find the gigantic, huge school. Um, but the, in the spring, usually from around late April, um, mid to late April through, um, early July, you'll find them in different areas throughout Baja California. They start to kind of move around. They meet together and then they start moving to the area and different places and everything. Um, and that, for me, is the, the best time to see them, um, is in the late spring, early summer season. Got it. Got it. Now, how can you go on one of these trips? Are, are you on a, a liveaboard, or are you staying in a hotel on land and going out each day? How, how does it work, and how long are the trips? So the, there's a few different ways to see them. Um, I mean, there's some places you can, or some operators that offer like day trips or like two hour tours out and everything like that. I, I find these tours a bit more limited because you can't really, you, you don't really get to experience them if they're too short, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and that also means that they have to stay closer to the cities and closer to the land and everything like that. So you kind of you lose some of the magic of it, you know what I mean? Um, and you won't find the biggest schools nearest to cities, and not because of boat traffic and everything. So the bigger schools are going to be more in obscure areas. Mm -hmm. um, there's no liveaboards or anything that runs things for that. Um, the main thing, the, the best way or whatever is to do like expedition. Um, Dive Ninjas, they, we do like uh, two different kinds of expeditions for next year we'll launch. Um, one is a five day expedition and the other is an eight day expedition. These are kind of land based trips, um, where you basically stay in a hotel and accommodation on land, um, and you go out every day. 
The reason for this that we find the land-based strips work a lot better is because the, the rays themselves are actually more active in the hours after sunrise and the hours just before sunset. So, you know, you're talking early summer, so you've got some of the longest uh, daylight hours in the entire year. Mm -hmm. um, so you really don't want to just be sitting on the ocean for 14 hours with nothing to do in that middle six hours or eight hours. <laughs> right. Uh, so we find that land-based works a bit better because we can then go out in the morning, search for them, have really good interactions, then go back to land, have a little break. Um, one of the trips, the types of trips we do are citizen science trips. So on those ones in the middle of the day when they're, they have lunch and then the biologists will give talks about the mantas and do some research activities with the guests and everything like that. Wow. Now, when you go back to the land, what what city are you normally in? All right. So I, I can't give away the actual city because it's a secret location where they run the expedition. Okay. Uh, but uh, it is in Baja California Sur is the main area. Um, what it is is with the expeditions, uh, the, well, the Dive Ninja Expeditions is based in Cabo San Lucas. That's the main, the entry point. Um, what they do is uh, for the expeditions is you meet in Cabo San Lucas at the um, offices and they provide transportation and every accommodation, et cetera, et cetera, for the whole length of the expedition. Um, they go out to a couple different places. It just depends on what the uh, sightings are like that week. Um, but they have like a, a few different kind of what they call like secret areas and ninja secret area where they see a lot of the, um, the best action. Got it. Got it. Now, and these areas are about a, it's about a two hour trans, uh, van ride to get there from Cabo. Okay. And then when you stay in your hotel, would it be in Cabo or would it be in these unique locations? No, the area, so the expedition, this is one of the things that I've been just really uh, prides itself on and is really good at. They build these kind of custom expeditions all around the Baja, um, and they're built into small local communities. So what they do is they utilize uh, local hotels or um, Airbnb-style places where they rent, like, big, you know, houses, like six-bedroom houses and stuff like that um, to kind of put the guests in and everything like that. So you have, like, proper accommodation, um, and you don't have to be traveling, you know, two hours every day back and forth and all that. You basically wake up in the morning and go out on the boat. Like the boat is the uh, five minute walk away and then um, you're on the boat. Got it. Now, if you go on a citizen science expedition, what might you be doing with the scientists in the afternoon? So we, the citizen science expeditions we run are in cooperation with a woman known, uh, called Marta Palacios. Mm -hmm. uh, she's a Mabula researcher working here in Baja California. Um, she recently, her research has been focused on locating uh, nursery areas for the Mabula. Um, actually, last year, she had uh, discovered or uh, the first ever Mabula species uh, nursery in the entire world. And it's right here in Baja California. So this year, the expeditions that we ran for, the, for 2019, the citizen science ones were aimed at trying to locate more nurseries, um, as well as trying to build population data, um, water data, like uh, for instance, like uh, pH balance, temperature, salinity, so, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They also look at what plankton's in the water and what kind of um, you know, planktonic animals that they're finding and everything like that because the mobulus feed on this kind of stuff, so they're trying to see there. They also want to build a survey of, like, males and females, a general population, uh, sizes, and these kind of things. One of the weird things with mobulus and most mobulus species, including oceanic mantas and all these kind of guys, is that um, there's not a lot known about them. And these specific, this specific species, which is uh, called Monk's Devil Ray, or Mabula monkeyana, um, there is very, very, very little information um, or research ever done into these animals. So she's trying to build a, a lot of different things. But the, the first thing is trying to develop an understanding of the, the nurseries and the um, population so that they can work to better protect them. Um, so during these trips, you kind of get to do, they'll do, you know, go through presentations, like they'll talk about the rays, they'll teach you about the, she teaches you about the rays and everything. But then you also get to do more hands-on activities, like they do plankton drags, and then so you can see what plankton looks like under the microscope and what the modules are feeding on, um, surveying, censuses, all different kinds of really cool uh, research activities. Mm -hmm. Now, when 
When people hear Ray, uh, I think many minds uh, turn to Steve Irwin and Stingrays. Um, how how are these mo mobula rays different from an average stingray you would see on a reef? They're completely different. So mobula rays are more closely related to manta rays. Um, so they do not have uh, mobulas, the, these mobulas among, among the devil rays, they don't have stingers at all. They're completely harmless to humans. Mm -hmm. um, they have no stingers. They look quite differently. They have uh, lobes on the front of their face that they use to funnel plankton into their mouth to feed. Um, they're kind of a different shape. They're more like a manta shape. So you've kind of got more like a, uh, almost like a diamond shape in a way. Um, because they're more, these are pelagic animals. They don't live on the bottom. They actually swim in open ocean at all times. That's a great description. Uh, so if you wanted to go on one of these trips and experience the rays, um, first off, how far in advance do you need to book the trip? And also, how can you book one of these trips? Okay, so for the expeditions, we usually recommend people book pretty far in advance. Um, it's because they sell out really quick. Uh, with the expeditions that Dog Ninjas runs, we do it in very small groups. Um, so you've only ever got like, six, it's usually a maximum of six guests um, on the trip. Wow. So they do this to kind of keep it very intimate um, and all, so that you can kind of get the best experience in the water and the best experience from the trip without having tons of people around you. Um, especially since we're working in very more rural areas, it, it feels more, uh, it, it, in my experience, it's more of a, a real feeling. Like you feel like you're actually experiencing Baja and you don't feel like you're on a tour. It's more like you're kind of just gone on a cool little trip in the middle of nowhere with some friends, you know. So the recommendation is to normally book as far out in advance. For us, the, for Dive Ninjas, they will release the dates for 20, the 2020 season, should release in early August. Um, and most likely, they will sell out pretty quick. Um, so I'd recommend uh, jumping on it quick. To get uh, to book, all you need to do is go on the website on DiveNinjaExpeditions.com um, and basically just pick a date and fill out a registration form, and then the reservations team contacts you to handle all the details, the payments, and all that kind of stuff. Got it. Got it. And then how much do these expeditions cost? So it depends on whether it's the citizen, the shorter citizen science one or the, the longer um, non-citizen science one. Um, the shorter ones usually run around, it's going to run around 1900 US dollars. Um, the longer ones are about double that because there's double the same amount of time as the other time in the water. Um, the prices, they include pretty much everything. So you meet in Cabo San Lucas, they provide transportation with the, basically with the guide and the rest of the group for your expedition um, to the area. Um, it's a nice air conditioned van and the guide's actually gonna do does some briefings and teaches you about the area on the way up there. Then you have a nice accommodation out there. Um, usually it's somewhere that's almost right on the beach or really close to the beach, um, you know, all the comforts of home, even though that you're in the middle of nowhere, you've got still Wi-Fi, you've got AC, you've got electric and all that kind of stuff. Um, then you've got basically three days of activities for the shorter day or for the shorter tours or the shorter expeditions and six days of um, in-water activities for the longer one. And then your transportation back. The only things that they don't uh, that aren't included are um, is like your, your meals at like dinner and these kind of things. Um, they do include lunch when you're on the boat, as well as snacks and drinks and this, that, that kind of stuff, um, as well as uh, breakfast at the accommodation in the morning. So you're basically on your own for dinner. Um, but there's restaurants in the town and all that. And usually what they do is every night the guide will say, like, okay, who's in the mood for what kind of food tonight? And, you know, they take everybody out to they go out to dinner together and all that. So you're not kind of looking around, having to search for yourself. And, and what's the recommended tip for this trip? Normally, I recommend like uh, same as like liveaboard. You see, about ten to twenty percent of your um, trip price is uh -huh. the general recommendation. Um, with dive ninjas, I know firsthand what they do is everything is split between everyone involved in it. So that's the captain, the boat crew, uh, you know, people cleaning the accommodations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Got it. 
Got it. Now, what if uh, you have limited mobility, but you're a great swimmer? Um, can you come on this trip? Yeah, it should be. It'd be fine. Okay, great. And and what specific? Oh, what specific uh, permits or certifications are needed um, to go on this expedition? So because it's a snorkeling and freediving experience, there's actually no real certifications required. Um, you can, just, as long as you're comfortable swimming in the open ocean or snorkeling in the open ocean, um, you know, somewhere that you might not be able to see the bottom, it's just blue water, um, it's totally fine. What we do recommend is, uh, with the mobulas especially, is uh, some kind of freediving experience is usually good. You don't need to be like an avid freediver or something like that, but just having a little bit of experience with it, um, or even coming in like a day or two days early to do a workshop with the freediving school at Dive Ninjas. Mm -hmm. um, that you can you know learn a little bit this will kind of help you have a, a bit better of an experience because the mobulas are not always right at the surface they may be like 10 or 15 feet under the surface so if you can free dive down a little bit or duck dive down it makes you you know you can get a little bit closer and see them you can also duck dive down into the schools and see that you know see what it's like and everything or swimming alongside the outside of the school so it kind of helps you out helps you to have a even better experience yeah now, what about uh, an age requirement? Uh, could you bring your kids on this type of trip? It would really depend on the children. There's not any specific age requirements or anything like that. It's just the same thing. Like they need to be really, for children, they need to be strong swimmers because it's, you know, it is proper swimming. For an adult, maybe not a big deal, but for a child, it's a lot more activity, you know what I mean, or a lot more work. Mm -hmm. um, so they would, uh, they should be pretty uh, strong swimmers and very comfortable in the ocean because you're, you know, off the coast. You're not like swimming on a reef somewhere. You're out in the middle of the ocean. Got it. Got it. But maybe age-wise, some of the days can get kind of long on the boats. You know what I mean? Sometimes you can be out there for six hours. Um, so it may not be great for really young kids, but maybe 10, 12 years old or something like that would be okay. uh, ideal so that they actually enjoy it and like, uh, you know. Now, what type of gear do you need to bring on this expedition? Um, the only real good, since it's free diving or snorkeling, all you really need is a uh, mask, fins, and snorkel. Um, usually, we recommend wetsuits because that time of the year the water can get a little bit chilly at the surface. Um, but like a three mil or even five mil is more than enough. Um, if you don't have equipment, you can also, of course, rent equipment from dive ninjas and anything like that. Okay, great. Now. This seems like an incredible photo opportunity. Uh, do you have any tips for underwater photographers and underwater videographers to really get the money shot? Yeah, it, it's funny too is that you say it because this this experience used to be it was kind of a very big secret between photographers and videographers like pros um, for a long time. <laughs> it, it's something that's been going on for a while, but not many people knew about except for like video pros and photo pros and everything like that. But now in the recent time, with uh, with they started to um, open the expeditions up to normal people, it's kind of like the idea behind diving ninjas is take people out to see these kind of things that normally are, you know, only reserved for pro photographers and videographers. But for tips, the, the, I mean, the big thing is underwater, you're going to want to shoot as wide as possible. Um, so having a nice wide angle lens, um, it is definitely incredible. Personally on my crop sensor, I shoot an eight millimeter fisheye, um, which is about equivalent to a 16 millimeter fisheye on a SLR. Mm -hmm. um, but you also really, it's really nice to have a long lens on the surface because when they're jumping and all these kind of things, you can get some really nice shots um, of them coming out of the water and splashing in and everything like that. Plus the, the area here, like these areas are completely gorgeous. It is true Baja California. So you have the big, you know, sandy brown, uh, oranges brown mountains coming up in the background and the bright blue ocean and everything like that. It is it, really beautiful, beautiful area for like landscapes and everything like that. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. Now, I've always brought a red filter with me when, when I've gone on like dive trips. Do you think a red filter is needed? 
with the, the problem, the red filters, um, depending on which level of density you have, like whether it's for snorkeling, diving, et cetera, um, they can kind of cause a little bit of an issue since this action happens really close to the surface. Um, but a lot of times you're too close to the surface to, for the red to actually even do anything. What it, it instead does is it turns your photos to look red. Um, so a lot of times we'll tell guests that they may want to actually remove the red filters um, unless they have more of a snorkeling density one, which are more like a light pink kind of color, um, oh. just because of the, uh, since they're really close at the surface. And if you, you know, you may free dive down and it does great when you get down, you know, 10 feet underwater, or 15 feet underwater or something like that. But then when you come back up, everything turns purple or red. So right. it's uh, usually uh, sometimes, or sometimes better off to go without it. Perfect. And as far as like tips to to getting close to the Mobula rays, um, do you do you have any secrets of the trade uh, for when you're when you're down there with them? Yeah. So one of the the big things is these animals are since they're you know harmless, they're they're essentially normally always prey for other animals. For like sharks or for orcas, etc. Um, so they can be quite timid. Um, they can be a bit shy and they can scare quite easily. So what we always tell the guests is one of the big things is when you get in the water, we get in nice and quietly. We kind of like slip into the water. We don't go like jumping off the back of the boat, giant stride style or anything like that, and make big splashes because the splashing scares them, tends to scare them away. So you want to get in nice and quiet, and then when you're in, it, it helps to to make sure you keep your fins under the water when you're kicking, so you're not making tons of splashing at the surface. One of the easiest ways to do this is just to turn on your side and swim a bit sideways so that your fins always stay under the water. Um, this will allow you to get up much closer to them because the, they don't hear the splashing or anything like that to kind of, you know, making them think that there's something coming for them. Um, with the guides, what they'll do is they'll, in the briefings, they'll tell you in the beginning that not no one to kind of don't go, everyone gets like super excited and wants to dive right down and like see them or swim right into the pool or something like that. So it is to, to relax and kind of chill out in the beginning and let the pool get accustomed to us, to us being around them. Um, you, if you give them a bit of time by maybe staying on the, the outsides of the school or in towards the back of the schools and everything like that, they, they know you're there and they start to, after a little bit, realize that you're not a threat, that you're not there to hurt them. Um, and that giving them that little bit of extra lead time creates such more um, better interactions in the long run because then once they see that we're not a threat to them, that's when you can start diving into the school and swimming above the school or in all these kind of things. Um, and then like, uh, cause you know, if they don't feel that you're threatening them, they'll let you get super close. Got it. Got it. Now you, you are out there in the open ocean, checking out these mobula rays. What are other animals that you might see on one of these expeditions? So this is the, the Sea of Cortez or as Jacques Cortez calls it, the, the world's aquarium. We've got all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, and in this season alone, this last season that just ended, um, we've seen fin whales, we've seen gray whales, um, they've seen a blue whale, um, turtles, it's been hammerheads, um, sailfish, uh, big schools of tuna. There was a one day with a school of tuna that was probably a, a couple hundred of them, like a huge, huge school, and they, each one of them was a good four to six feet long. Um, so lots of, you know, pretty much all the, you know, pelagic animals. We've also had uh, oceanic manta rays. We've had um, giant devil rays. Actually, one of the last trip I, I worked on, I ran the season was for a photographer out of Australia and um, is running a private trip. It was the last expedition of the entire season on the last day, the last day of the last expedition of the season. And um, we were getting ready to head back into the marina, and the sun was just about set. And we saw the captain had spotted some wingtips coming up out of the water, some fins coming up. At first, they thought maybe it was uh, some kind of shark, like a, a hammer or something like that. It was a bit in the distance. But as we got closer, um, we started to realize that it was uh, some kind of ray, but a very large ray. Um, 
so we started to track for a little while and eventually we were able to slip into the water and at the same point we sent up a drone to see where they were and see what was going on from the uh, sky to kind of get an idea because the, the the tips of the fins kept popping up in different areas so we were a little confused on why it was zigzagging um but what we learned is that it wasn't actually zigzagging it was an entire school of giant devil rays um and these this for anyone that knows devil rays or giant devil rays it's very very rare to see them together like ever wow. in a school more solitary animal um and we were able to catch the last hour of daylight with these rays um with about 15 to 20 of them swimming around us in the water and coming straight up to the camera like straight up to the, the guests in the water and everything like that and that kind of uh, with the drone footage it looks like they're almost dancing with the uh, the divers because they would kind of go past and go away and then they'd go down deep and then they'd come straight up uh, from underneath them and come right up to them and go around them and all that all as like the sun setting in the background and everything is beautiful mm, that sounds like perfection absolute perfection yeah, I couldn't ask for a better way to end the season no not at all well, I love how you travel. This is my kind of trip, and hopefully the kind of trip our listeners would love to go on. Uh, do you have anything else that you'd like to add um, before we end the show? Uh, not that I could think of off the top of my head. Um, I, before, I just to uh, remind that the expedition season for 2020 will release in the early August, so definitely... Keep an eye out for that. Um, they'll announce, Dive Ninjas will announce it on social media, on Facebook and Instagram and all that kind of stuff before it goes out on the website. Um, another secret tip is if you get on their mailing list, they usually send out emails to the mailing list a few days before it uh, releases to the public. So that's always a little helper to when the, just make sure you can uh, secure a space before they sell out. Great. I will include links to dive ninjas expeditions as well as a link to your mailing list in the show notes on experiences you should have.com and uh, and we'll be talking to you in the future because we have some really cool experiences uh, that i want to keep on hearing from you about so definitely stay tuned awesome looking forward to it yeah. Well, thank you, Jay. I really appreciate your time and sharing this amazing adventure with us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's been awesome. It's great to talk with you guys. Love it. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much for listening to Experiences You Should Have, your how-to guide for amazing experiences. And go to experiencesyoushouldhave.com. You can find the show notes there for this episode. I'll include photos, links, all the information that Jay spoke about today and more. And also, uh, please share this podcast with a, a friend, a coworker, your mom, uh, tweet and go on Instagram where on Instagram is experiences podcast so please share this with the world and and as you may know I am I'm like an ocean freak I love the ocean and I'm a huge proponent of of taking care of the ocean using less plastic and also going and experiencing these animals in the wild without handling them. I, I believe these ocean animals um, should be out free in the ocean and for you to be able to go in a small group and experience like these mobula rays, for example, out in the wild, um, but without handling them or altering their behavior uh, that's, that's really what I'm all about. And I love getting to go out into the ocean and have these incredible adventures, which is why there's going to be some more episodes from J clue with dive ninja expeditions, uh, of talking about some of the other expeditions they offer. So please stay tuned for some really fun ocean fun 
uh, that you don't have to be a diver for uh, necessarily. Uh, a lot of these expeditions are free diving or snorkeling. And if you're interested in taking a free diving course, um, uh, Jay, they do offer a free diving course with Dive Ninja Expeditions. Uh, also, if you are in the Hawaii area, um, uh, my good friends at Konohonu Divers offer a great free diving course. Uh, definitely check them out if you're in the Hawaii area, Konohonu Divers. Uh, I think free diving is a really cool thing to allow you to get underwater and experience uh, these animals without scaring them with uh, bubbles. And and you want to learn how to free dive safely. So I highly recommend uh, taking a course and, and learning about free diving and, and how you can prevent uh, something as like shallow water blackout. And until next time, there will be a new adventure coming. <laughs>